Welcome to the opening webinar of Agenda 2022, the Pearson Centre's Fall Conference on the Priorities that the New Parliament and Government Should Address in 2022 and Beyond. My name is Francesca Iacorto and I'm a board member at the Pearson Centre. I'm also the Senior Director of Public Affairs at the National Airlines Council of Canada. Let me begin that we, by acknowledging that we are meeting virtually on the land of the First Nation, Inuit and Métis people. We pay tribute to Indigenous peoples across Canada and their ancestors for their tremendous contributions to this country. As you may know, the Pearson Centre is a le leading progressive think tank that addresses the challenging social and economic issues of the day. We are proud to say that we are the only think tank that invites representatives from all federal parties, along with the top business, labour and civil society leaders, as well as many other experts. As we like to say, we bring people and ideas together. And now a very special thank you to the donors and sponsors that make all our events possible, particularly our sustaining sponsors that include Canada's Building Trades Unions, the International Association of Firefighters, and MFSEO, Ontario's professional employees. And another very special thank you to the sponsors for this conference that include Bruce Power and Mr. Charles Coffey. Now, very briefly on the format, we will have two back-to-back -back one hour sessions. And within each one of those sessions, we will be spending the first 40 minutes or so in a discussion with our guests, with the balance of the time being dedicated to answering questions from you, the audience. So please use the question box on your screen and we will get to as many questions as we can. Today, we have two terrific panels of Canadians who work in various fields and have addressed economic development as well as energy policy in different ways. For our first panel on innovative uh, economic development, mm -hmm. we are joined by the Honourable Lisa Raitt, who is currently Vice Chair of Global Investment Banking at CIBC. Of course, she also served as a cabinet minister in the Harper administration with responsibilities for portfolios, including labor, transportation, and natural resources. I'm also pleased to note that the Pearson Center has awarded her the Pearson Progressive Leadership Award. And I want to compliment her for her very strong leadership on the issue of young onset dementia. She also co-chairs the Coalition for a Better Future and will be discussing that group's work with us here today. We also have with us Senator Peter Harder, who's a member of the Progressive Senate Group and was a senior public servant and deputy minister being, before being appointed to the Senate in 2016. He leads the Senate Prosperity Action Group, which issued a report in September 2021 on the economic recovery for Canada. We also have with us today Catherine Scott, who is a senior researcher with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, whose recent reports include their annual alternate federal budget and recovery through equality, which are key to our discussion today. Catherine is a seasoned social policy researcher with the CCPA and other organizations. Our moderator to start off um, the session today will be Brian Gallant, who is a co-chair of this conference, as well as the CEO of the Canadian Centre for the Purpose of the Corporation. Brian is, of course, a former Premier of New Brunswick and currently serves on the advisory board of the Pearson Centre. So this particular session will end just before uh, noon Eastern time, at uh, which time Andrew Cardozo, who is the president of the Pearson Centre, will be uh, joining us to get us started with the uh, second panel. So on that note, uh, I will turn the floor over to uh, Brian. Merci beaucoup, Francesca. Merci à vous tous et toutes d'être parmi nous. Nous sommes ravis de vous accueillir. We're all really excited to hear from our panelists the biggest problem we have is the three of them have been working on such interesting initiatives and releasing reports, insights, and data that we find ourselves with little time to discuss it all. But we're going to do the best we can. Uh, we're excited to hear from them, but we also want to hear, as Francesca mentioned, from you. So please put in your questions at the question box of this webinar around two-thirds of the way into this uh, session. We'll get to as many of your questions as we can. So uh, with that said, let's get started. Uh, very excited to have all of you here. So thank you very much for taking some time. Uh, Catherine, I'd like to start 
with you. I, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives has recently released its Alternative Federal Budget 2022, mm -hmm. entitled Mission Critical, A Just and Equitable Recovery. Uh, an array of progressive perspectives have been woven into this uh, alternative budget, as you call it. Uh, from that exercise, a focus on just and equitable recovery, with uh, also your report covering a lot of sustainability questions and issues. Uh, why were these chosen? Why were these essentially the focus of the report? And, and maybe talk a little bit about the process of having all of these different perspectives included. That's great. Thank you, Brian. And uh, thanks to the Pearson Center. It's a real pleasure to be uh, discussing uh, a progressive uh, recovery process with um, Senator Harder and, uh, um, and Ms. Raitt. I just think it's a great opportunity and um, looking forward to getting into these issues and talking about our organization. As you said, I'm, I'm from the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives and every year for the past 25 plus years, the CCPA has been involved in creating an alternative federal budget. And this was started the mid 90s, actually after the famous Chrétien budget, uh, the 1995 uh, Paul Martin uh, Jean Chrétien budget. Uh, an initiative that went to communities and said, well, you know, what are community perspectives on budget making? How, what type of alternatives? How can community engage, groups get engaged? What sort of policy ideas should be, they should be putting forward? And they started at that time crafting and building out that budget. So it's evolved over the years. We have upwards of, you know, groups across the spectrum, environmental groups, indigenous organization, community-based groups, huge range of people, upwards of 100 people, who gather every year to put forward their ideas in a range, across a range of federal public policy areas. Um, it's crafted, we um, crunch the numbers, the economists at the center then look and help cost out new initiatives, look at revenue strategies to help support those particular initiatives and come up with estimates you know, for potential impact. You, typically using the parliamentary budget office base case so you know we put forward what we believe to be credible alternatives for moving forward with progressive future and as you can well imagine our last number like this last 20 months we've been wholly focused obviously on the crisis in front of us and responding in real time it's been an extraordinary period actually for public policy in Canada with this type of the immediacy and the, the speed with which massively huge public policy programs are being rolled out to serve on all on all manner of areas um, and we've generated policy alternatives and as you said our recent um our recent alternative federal budget mission critical uh, summarizes those as pertains to hopefully in the lead up to the 2022 budget we expect sometime in the spring i know there's a fiscal update coming in a couple of weeks but uh, the, these policies are obviously that's the primary audience looking at the federal budget in february march Fantastic, Catherine. Thank you very much again for being here. It's a wonderful report and anybody who is interested in public policy, I encourage you to read it. Uh, Lisa, the Coalition for a Better Future has brought together an array of groups and organizations from the private sector, NGOs, thought leaders, and so forth. Uh, how important is it post-pandemic to be seeing this type of collaboration? How is that type of collaboration going so far as well? Well, it's going well. We have about 115 uh, associations and organizations that have signed on to the Coalition for a Better Future. And the people are coming together because there's a common belief that economic growth isn't just a given in Canada, that it actually has to be a policy imperative. And from economic growth is where you get inclusion, where you get climate, climate programs, where you, where you make sure that everything is sustainable. And as a result, the the coalition came together because the notion is this, that having stagnant growth and just eking out 1.2% of increased GDP per year just isn't going to cut it. When you take a look at our demographic challenges that are coming, when you take a look at our ambitious plans around climate and our ambitious plans around inclusion and reconciliation, we need to have that economic driver. So we gathered in November and had a series of, I guess, panels and discussions from all kinds of different people within the economic sphere, including uh, charitable organizations, non-governmental organizations, non-for-profits, as well as business, as well as associations that represent industry. And the common thread throughout all of it is we wanted to have a scorecard 
that focused on the things which were of concern for the coalition, which was jobs and job creation, climate change, and inclusion, and that we would measure these as compared to OECD standards just to see whether or not policymakers were tuning into the fact that economic growth is going to be important in the long run. And the, the what was really interesting though, Brian, was how many people just kind of came to their own conclusion, yeah, we need to put more effort into overall big economic growth policy to ensure that what we want to accomplish that we can accomplish. In my case, I can give you my personal, my personal reason for being involved. I went through one election and I watched another election. In fact, I think I've gone through three elections now and watched one election where the concept of economic growth and how we're going to achieve it really wasn't on the agenda at all. Elections have become transactional. It's about projects. It's not about the bigger picture of how we're going to grow our economy as a nation. And as a result, I thought that the debate wasn't happening. And bringing the organizations together to talk to one another, much like Catherine pointed out, they talk to one another. Um, pulling together and coming up with a, a scorecard, I think, is a really good first step. So the Honorable Anne McClellan and I are co-chairing this because it is nonpartisan in its offering. And we hope that any party uh, would be interested in what we are trying to accomplish and what we're trying to pull together. Well, thank you, Lisa. It definitely is an impressive group of individuals and organizations, and it's wonderful to see you and Anne working on this together. Uh, I'll speak for myself, but maybe you came to the same conclusion. It's a bit easier, a little less stress to watch an election than it is to actively participate in it, uh, but that's that's a whole other panel. Senator Harder, uh, thank you very much for joining as well. You were part of a group of senators uh, I believe that you've called yourself the Prosperity Action Group. And uh, this brings together different caucuses to, to, to speak about common issues and try to find common ground. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that experience and maybe what are some of the elements of clear consensus that came from that process? I think you might be on mute. There, sure, Senator. thank you very much. And it's a delight to be on. No, I don't good. believe I am. You're okay. No, you're good, you're good. Uh, okay, um, delight to be on on the panel uh, with uh, both Lisa and Catherine. Uh, the Prosperity Action Group in the Senate was formed a little over a year ago. Uh, we were debating one of the emergency bills uh, for the COVID response. And of course, the Senate quite properly felt that it needed to deal with this matter uh, expeditiously and appropriately so the measures could be in place. Uh, but a couple of us also formed the view that it wasn't too soon to begin to ask uh, three big policy questions. One is, uh, where is the economic growth going to come from to sustain our economic and social well-being? The second, uh, what is a realistic fiscal anchor for the Government of Canada in the face of a post-COVID reality? Uh, anybody who suggests that it's a balanced budget in the short term uh, is inviting a, a recession. And anybody who says you don't need one uh, doesn't understand the leviathan nature of government itself uh, and the third question was what do we what have we learned from the COVID experience uh, of across uh, government cooperation stakeholder relationships uh, and inclusive growth uh, inclusiveness that can uh, inform our growth agenda uh, we spent uh, a good part of the of the uh, season uh, until june having 43 meetings, meeting with 73 experts, mostly Canadian, uh, from business and academia, from, uh, uh, from uh, practical uh, advice. But we also had some interesting international participants, including Kristalina Georgieva, the IMF director, uh, Larry Summers, uh, and Joe Stiglitz, who have interesting views on these matters from a global perspective and certainly from an American perspective. Uh, and we did this in the context of a broad understanding amongst our group. And as you indicated, Brian, our group was representative of all groups in the Senate. A broad understanding that Canada was facing some very significant uh, headwinds and has been for some time. You know, one observer said that uh, the single greatest challenge in public policy is dealing with incremental decline. And there are so many uh, items around the Canadi Canadians' performance indicators, which were incremental decline, the sluggish growth rate, the current account deficit, the weak productivity numbers, 
labor market gaps that remain unaddressed, the reality of an aging population, interprovincial trade barriers, which have uh, continued to be um, uh, impediments to economic growth, our tax competitiveness and, and uh, effectiveness uh, of our compliance regimes. And some would even suggest that our broad regulatory framework policies are not designed for the digital revolution uh, that we are undergoing. Uh, so we needed to have a broader framework, uh, f not only recognizing the headwinds, but the transitions that we are uh, uh, all going through, be that either uh, uh, the transition to a low carbon economy, the transition that includes the fourth industrial revolution, the digitalization of the economy, the human capital transformation uh, that attends those uh, realities, uh, the geopolitical climate is, is uh, changing, and overarching that, we need to have a more inclusive and shared prosperity uh, to sustain and legitimize, frankly, uh, the economic strategy of the Government of Canada. Thank you, Senator. I, for those listening that are potentially decision makers or that can influence decision makers, it's an insightful report, and, and I, I certainly invite you to read it. Uh, well. We, I, we certainly want to talk post-pandemic. We're all very keen to see that and, and, and to speak of it, but there's still work to be done with regards to COVID and the pandemic. So let's take a moment uh, to acknowledge that and speak about that. So Catherine, the alternative budget speaks directly to measures that can be taken to help Canadians get through the pandemic. Uh, let's hope the last leg of the pandemic, uh, such as paid sick leave, um, addressing the backlog of the pandemic in terms of healthcare, uh, mental health uh, supports, uh, there are many measures. So if, if you'd like to speak to that and in the importance of making sure we don't lose sight that there's still some work to be done. Absolutely. I think uh, we're talking, I'm struck with where we're at. I think we're, um, I'm not sure we're looking at the end of the pandemic. I think what we're doing is struggling with where we are in this moment and the pandemic will actually be with us forevermore, that we need to be thinking more of it as uh you know, as we move forward and certainly creating public policies that address this ongoing source of uncertainty and the, the knowledge that this will probably become endem endemic. Certainly the pandemic um, graphically revealed the failings of our current public policy regimes. It certainly in look, looked at ways in which inequality was baked into our political institutions and baked into our um, economy. We focus in the um, alternative federal budget on several areas and certainly um, specific with regard to our pandemic response, you know, the failure of our public health infrastructure and the neglect that that occasioned even after the experience with SARS, we make recommendations certainly for the development of a much more robust legal and financial framework to uh, support public health initiatives in Canada and to facilitate the type of pan-Canadian coordination that was voluntarily in evidence at the very beginning, but obviously fell by the wayside as we've moved forward, but we really need to revisit that. We need to obviously make critical investments in our public health, our, our health, public health system infrastructure that include um, uh, addressing certainly the backlogs and the, the huge systemic strain that's now underway. Mental health, you mentioned, um, we focus a good deal in the chapter I wrote was on the care economy and long-term care, child care. These are all critical areas, obviously, that were, you know, found grievous failures, certainly most graphically in our long-term care programs where, you know, upwards of 4,000, certainly here in Ontario, 4,000 vulnerable seniors died in our long-term care, which, you know, um, wholly, um, which speaks to the, 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 um, uh, the disconnect between our stated public goals and the tools in place. So we have a number of uh, proposals with that, including uh, significant uh, federal provincial transfers to support those caring systems tied to national standards and regulations. Well, thank you for that. Uh, the, the Prosperity Action Group, uh, Senator, advocates for yes, inclusive growth, but but first, a little bit to Lisa's point at the at the top of the webinar, we can't take growth for granted. So, so if we want to have an inclusive economy, we we obviously want to have a robust economy. What would be some of the maybe action items that you would see us being able to take as a country to ensure that moving forward? Yeah, uh, well, we make a number of recommendations. Uh, uh, certainly, tax reform amongst them. Um, uh, we are so bold as to suggest that there ought to be an increase in the uh, GST, the HST, uh, to um, 
to contribute to the fiscal uh, sustainability of, of government expenditures. We also, by the way, and, and we'll get to that later, Lisa, uh, speak about uh, fiscal anchors. Uh, yes, absolutely. And and uh, fa fascinating, um, I think, uh, proposals put forward and, and very concrete ones as well, if I might add. And Lisa, I wanted to give you a, ch a chance to chat about this as well, because I know, again, off the top of the webinar, you said we can't take this for, for granted. And that's a bit of the basis as to why a lot of the groups got together. So mm -hmm. recognizing that we need more inclusive growth, uh, what are some of the other elements that we need to put into place if we're going to have uh, growth uh, in Canada moving forward? Well, right now the coalition's kind of agnostic on what policy measures are needed because we're in the process of, of hearing from everybody. But what we do point to is the fact that there are some really good documents and really good pieces of work out there that have already taken a look at these at these pieces. So Dominic Barton had a report that he gave to the Minister of Finance, which is great. Navdeep Baines, when he was minister, had all of these sectoral uh, panels that came up to talk about what to do with COVID and how to come out in economic growth. That's a good piece of information. The senator stuff, Catherine stuff, I think all of those things are important pieces of public policy that knitted together can shape an economic growth agenda. Our point of view is you got to have it on the agenda. And we're just not convinced that we're seeing those kinds of big, bold policy statements and it's more transactional as opposed to having the bigger picture and making sure that you're looking at economic growth as an essential part of accomplishing what you would like to accomplish in these other policy frameworks. And I, I would just point out the key for the scorecard is that we're watching and measuring how well we are doing. So for example, let's say next year we come out and we can see that we've dropped in certain of our standards around Canada. That should be an indicator to public policymakers and those who make these decisions that things are not okay and that we really need to take another look at uh, economic growth. Well, th thank you for that. So let's go back into the uh, alternative budget, if that's okay, Catherine. So you, sure. uh, in this, uh, you and the team have certainly put forward some very specific measures that would be able to advance more inclusion uh, in the in the Canadian economy. So would you speak maybe to a few of those measures and, and what you think needs to be done? Uh, absolutely. Um, it's a broad document. We focus on a number of areas, sustainability, and then we'll touch on that. Um, uh, as you mentioned, inclusion, Indigenous reconciliation. We have a large section on income security, as well as the imperative to create decent jobs and to, to generate greater, as we've been talking about, greater wealth. On With respect to job creation, we certainly spend a good deal of time talking about the need to revisit uh, the infrastructure programs that we have in place, and in particular housing is a huge area that demands attention. Currently have a national housing strategy that has been somewhat slow at generating, certainly articulates important goals, but has been slow on delivering. And we have a number of recommendations about the critical importance of facilitating and unlocking those public funds to generate, and in particular, expanding our stock of social housing, which is uh, has fallen way short of obviously need. We see that um, increased, the, you know, the urgency of that in the current context, where we've seen a huge increase in housing prices, which is impacting low-income Canadians most acutely. Uh, we have a number of recommendations as well as physical infrastructure tied to um, a green economy agenda that needs to, to move forward with um, expeditions, you know, a set of clear goals tied to uh, the, um, with certainly recommendations to the government as they craft their new plan. I guess it's been delayed for three months, but waiting with great a deal of anticipation for the new uh, plan that, to bring forward um, their climate change to realize the goals, obviously, in the new targets the government has set for 2030 and 2040. We take the position, certainly, that uh, we need to be seen. We have to look at the wind down of fossil fuels, uh, a tremendous challenge to the Canadian economy, but critically necessary. I don't think we've lived through this past year with the heat domes and the flooding with BC to not understand that central to what a bold task the government must action. And we've, we've been wasting time. Canada's been treading water. We've not met any appreciably any of our targets, as I know um, Ms. Rake's uh, scorecard will demonstrate. We really need to, need to take more decisive action on, on climate. And again, we uh, there's lots. those are some of the policies that we focus on in the AFD this year. 
Well, there certainly seems to be, thank you, Kat, there certainly seems to be a consensus growing that the pandemic has exacerbated inequalities and inequities and that there's a risk that the economic recovery be uneven. And, and that certainly, I think, uh, is at the heart of, of all of your work and, and the work of your organizations. So another kind of, you know, going a, another layer into that topic, uh, another thing that becomes really clear, all of your reports and, and efforts are talking about Indigenous reconciliation, are talking about uh, doing more for those living with a disability, uh, talking about gender equality and helping ensure that uh, that women will be able to benefit from the economic recovery uh, as much, if not more, uh, given the exacerbation of inequalities over the pandemic. So let's explore all of that uh, in, sure. in a few in, 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 in just a few minutes. minutes but lots to cover. So, so Senator Harder, I'll start with you. The Prosperity Action Group proposes 2030 targets regarding the labor force participation rate of many groups, including Indigenous people, people living with a disability, racialized Canadians. Could you maybe speak a little bit about why that was one of the, the measures uh, chosen and, and talk a little bit about the target and what needs to happen? Yeah, sure. Uh, unless and until racialized Canadians, minority groups, and those who have been traditionally excluded from a high economic uh, um, uh, performance, uh, unless that improves, uh, we will not have the growth and inclusive growth that we need. So we've had some very specific targets for groups, uh, uh, not only labor participation levels, but also in the case, for example, of indigenous businesses, <clears throat> that there be a higher performance of indigenous bu businesses through very specific goals <clears throat> of uh, uh, of equity participation in uh, in business. Uh, by Indigenous uh, business owners and individuals. Uh, the whole objective here is to grow an economy in which everybody benefits. Without that, we will not have the legitimacy, frankly, to sustain the discipline necessary for those growth measures. Absolutely fantastic. Lisa, very, very similar question. In terms of the scorecard, the coalition will be tracking the share of women in senior management positions, the share of Indigenous people in senior management positions, as well as looking at income parity across gender and, and people with disabilities. So maybe speak a little bit about uh, why those were, were measures and, and, uh, and things that you want to track uh, based yeah. on what the coalition's mission is. Yeah, uh, I agree completely with what Senator Harder just said about the fact that inclusion in the, from the workforce is incredibly important. I mean, immigration into the country is such a driver of, of GDP and of, of economic prosperity. And the same could be said if we just tap into those pockets uh, that aren't represented. It can it actually is a great way of domestically homegrown growing the economy as well. So it makes a, a lot of sense. So from our point of view in terms of looking at the different, uh, I guess, metrics, for lack of a better word, um, I was struck by something that Chief Terry Paul said when they uh, when they announced that they were going to be taking over Clearwater Foods in partnership. And the what he said was um, that right now, where the jobs may be, may be in the fishery, it may be uh, in the processing, but in the future, he wants the jobs to be the lawyers, he wants the jobs to be the accountants, he wants them on the board of directors. And I thought, well, that's exactly what we have to what we have to measure. And it, it is may take a little bit longer than we had anticipated. As Chief Terry would say, this is a 500 year investment, not a five year investment. But not, you know, that makes a whole lot of sense to me. So one of the things that we take a look at is the percentage of, uh, of Indigenous peoples in senior management. And on, on the woman side, we're going to be monitoring that carefully. Coming out of COVID, Brian, I and maybe this is just my my personal opinion, but I'll give it anyway for what it's worth coming from the banking industry. I have a, I'm have very concerned uh, about what's going to happen to women as we come out of the COVID recovery. And I'll tell you why. If Catherine's right, and we're going to be living with this for a long period of time, the majority of, of people who are caregivers in this country are women. And they're looking after vulnerable people. Oftentimes, they're people with Alzheimer's, like in my case. There is a higher standard in terms of how for lack of a better word, clean we are from any kind of COVID interaction in order to look after our loved one or, or even go and see our loved one. Therefore, choices will be made 
for women to do more remote work, more hybrid work. So they're not going to be in the workplace making the decisions or actually having the face time, losing opportunities for training, losing opportunities for advancing, um, not being able to get on a plane and going seeing a client because they have these other responsibilities. And quite frankly, if you go to the hospital right now to see a loved one or a nursing home, you're asked if you've ever been in contact with somebody with COVID. So you're really trying to minimize what your exposure is to COVID. If that actually translates into women not returning or advancing after COVID, I think that's an incredibly important measure to have. And where it's gonna show up is gonna show up in senior management positions because women are just not progressing in their in their career path. This, that will be another barrier, yeah. Well, yeah. th thank you for that, Lisa. Look, Catherine, I'd like to give you a moment because I know in the alternative budget, uh, you speak about the care economy, of course, childcare as well. And, yes. and Senator, if you have anything else to add, although I, I, your labor participation target, I think, speaks for itself as well with regards to, to ensuring that we track the gender uh, elements of that. But Catherine, over to you. No, I, I think Lisa's 100% right. I think we're at a cusp. You know, it's interesting. We just had the November jobs report was out on Friday. And you know we are seeing uh, some employment levels coming back, but not for all industries, not for all groups. And you know there's this large number of people, upwards of 150,000 people, who've left the labor market over the period of time since February 2020. Large chunk of those are women. A large chunk of them are women over 55. And whether they're taking early retirement because they've done more often than not, they have caregiving responsibilities, and you know the challenges of actually putting that together are untenable. They were untenable before. They're actually hit, you know, acute right now. And you know, we do have what looking forward, and you know, you can talk about what the future labor market will look like, but we really have like the good jobs, bad jobs debate, you know, a divide that's widening between those of us who have the privilege to work at home in well-paid employment and those of us who actually will not have that choice. And yet, you know, that will again define good jobs and bad jobs. So how do we actually create inclusive? prosperity going forward? How do we actually tackle those employment gaps, many of which are, will be compounded? You know, you know, we're, workers in the um, hospitality industry still fearful of going back. Why wouldn't they be fearful of going back, yet, you know, harangue for being malingerers on income security programs? I mean, it's a very complex, uncertain situation. So I think we need to be acknowledging those divisions and really, as you're saying, focusing on groups that have been historically marginalized. I want to say a bit about um, the importance of tracking that, and certainly Senator Harder and Ms. Reid has have talked about the indicators and the scorecards. Sometimes, you know, you measure what you can measure. Sometimes that kind of data actually doesn't, we don't have the data to measure those experiences. And sometimes we lose sight of, um, uh, you know, the politics behind it, the skew of public policy and the like. We don't want to get too focused on the number of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, whether the targets around employment or whatnot, they're important measures, but we, I guess my point is that we have to go step back and say, what are these public policies doing? Do we have a strong foundation of public policy and security? Are we letting the market dominate in particular care industries, you know, private markets that delivered such hideous outcomes in the long-term care sector? We really have to ask some fundamental questions in, about the values that inform public policy going forward to make sure we have inclusive growth. So that will be pick, picked up in certainly the indicators we're looking at. Fascinating points all around. So uh, I might change gears a little bit here, but obviously very much on the same topic. Uh, in general, climate change. Uh, all, all of your efforts are certainly uh, discussing uh, how Canada can step up and ensure that we're doing what we can to fight climate change. So Lisa, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah. There are six categories in the coalition scorecard. One is climate change, which is under yeah. the growing sustainably section. Uh, what are the elements of the scorecard and, and what needs to happen uh, to hit the targets that you set out in this scorecard? Well, uh, the 115 organizations were asked what their priorities are and there is 97% agreement that it was job, job creation, it was inclusion in the, in the economy, and it was about climate change. So it is an incredibly important metric to measure, not only in terms of emission reduction, which is so important to not only what we promise to do on the world stage, but just what's important for the world to achieve. And then secondly, it's important to take a look at how clean tech is doing as an industry. Do we have the right policy framework in place so that we're not saying we must reduce emissions, which we all agree we're going to reduce emissions, but then you don't put in place 
the characteristics or the or the parameters needed in order to have these clean tech companies actually grow and have investment in these companies. So we're going to measure um, the clean tech contribution to GDP because that will make an awful lot of sense. And then, of course, uh, I think it's important to measure our electricity and our power across the country and seeing what percentage is coming from zero carbon emissions. And I think that is that is a move that is going to be happening quite quickly. Um, but again, making sure that the investment is there for it and economic growth. And, you know, we had uh, Peter Tzerkian on one of our panels and he laid it out pretty barely, you know, it's going to take multi-billions of dollars of investment to get us to where we want to go. So let's make sure that we're we're driving that economic growth as well. Lisa, let me just add uh, with a shameless plug to, to a report that I co-authored with Robert Greenhill of Global Canada uh, entitled Canadian Voices on the Role of Business and Society. And to your point, uh, to, I was actually taken back to what extent it was very clear amongst the business C-suite executives that we interviewed for the report, climate change was was top of the list in terms of challenges that, that we're all facing, inequalities and inequities, social cohesion, Canada's place in the world, and Indigenous reconciliation kind of yep. topping the, the, the main challenges. But to your point, uh, very much top of mind of of I think all institutions, including business. Senator Harder, um, over to you. What are some of the measures proposed by the Prosperity Action Group to fight climate change. And I know Lisa spoke to, about clean tech and that, that that certainly was at least one element of the things that uh, your group would like to see happen a bit more and, and more investments in uh, here in Canada. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, certainly the points that Lisa raised are present in our report, but let me respond by adding a, a dimension, which I, I think we haven't talked about yet, which our report goes to quite a bit. And that is the, the agenda we are setting is not just for the government of Canada. It is for Canada. Yeah. Uh, and that means that we have to have a, a more cooperative federalism uh, in terms of federal, provincial, territorial engagement on these issues, but also a more mature involvement of other stakeholders be they business, be they civil society, uh, and uh, uh, racialized communities. My point here is uh, that without a, a broader shared agenda, we will simply be calling on one aspect, one element of going forward, the government of Canada, and we need to, to do more. We've had, by my count, 35 federal, provincial, territorial meetings of, uh, of first ministers on the COVID. Should we not at least have five on the economy? Yeah. Uh, could we not have some degree of shared articulation of what our objectives are? And in the commit in in our report, we suggest the creation of a prosperity council, uh, which would advise all of the stakeholders, including levels of government, uh, on what are the performance indicators and policy initiatives that we can have a shared commitment to, uh, and therefore measure progress on. I think that's an important element of this whole debate. In Canada, it's not just what do you want to do, it's how do you want to achieve it and what do you need to do to achieve these complex goals in a federation. Hey, uh, fascinating stuff. Um, this one, I'm this next topic I'm really interested in because I think the three of you uh, and, and the organizations, groups that you've been working with uh, certainly have, have addressed this, but maybe from different perspectives. So really fascinated uh, for the following topic, which is the finances. Uh, so I think if you look at the reports uh, and work that you've all done, uh, there's certainly a, a recognition that we need sustainability uh, in all its forms, which includes the financial uh, picture for, for the country. So I'd be really curious, uh, Catherine, I'll go to you first. Sure. Um, policy alternatives through the alternative budget certainly speaks of this, uh, makes the point that yes, deficits are higher, but that was uh, not to put words in the in the report's mouth, but that that it was probably warranted to at least some extent uh, given the pandemic, um, but also makes the point of looking at the debt to GDP ratio uh, while sort of uh, yeah. trying to determine uh, what type of investments to make forward. So so maybe speak a little bit about how you would see uh, through the alternative budget, uh, the, the government of Canada sort of uh, making the investments needed to do all the things we've been discussing while also ensuring financial sustainability in the long term. Absolutely. Uh, you know, certainly that's been a feature of all of our alternative federal budgets. We cost our programs. We've been pretty unapologetic for 25 plus years about the we believe in the importance of the government 
as an important player, we believe, certainly believe um, uh, are fully supportive. The federal government stepped up at this time using the fiscal powers at its disposal to you know, introduce what, you know, historically uh, massively large public interventions to support households and businesses this past year. We certainly support that. We include upwards many strategies, certainly speaking about transition, right, uh, environmental um, uh, to carbon zero number of strategies with large um, price tags on, but we believe it's wholly within the federal government's ability and, am and mandate to introduce those types of policies. And we also identify revenue strategies to do that because we do believe that it's important. You know, this moment has been interesting because, uh, you know, really you see a reworking. This isn't like it was with the recession in 2008-9. We're really seeing, you know, the sort of the limits of a neoliberal paradigm and an austerity agenda. In fact, you know, measures that austerity measures that were brought introduced in after the last recession, you know, facilitated recession. Like we know that now there's a new shift, I think, in thinking about fiscal and monetary policy and the government's role in that. And then we see that here and the importance of making those types of investments. We also, um, we take very seriously the importance of identifying revenue strategies to offset government uh, responsibilities. We identify $76 billion worth of revenue strategy, including super, uh, you know, corporate um, wealth tax, a, ta uh, a tax on super, um, uh, super profits among corporate pro corporations that have, you know, generated massive, you know, upwards of a third of a, you know, huge number of companies that have generated massive um, profits during, during this period. We look at uh, taxation, tax evasion, there's a variety of things that we look at because that's equally as important. But I do think we're at a moment where we're rethinking um, the role of the state. Um, certainly, historically low interest rates, you see what the federal government's doing with that. We believe it's a moment to take advantage of that to make the investments we need to ensure a sustainable future. Well, I, I'm going to be biased when I say this because I, I as Premier, did some of this, but I, I want to also give credit, and I think it's important, because the alternative budget, I was impressed. I mean, going through it, you also suggest some tough decisions. You, you uh, Reforms could be, uh, kind of quoting the report, financed by eliminating the, Can the Canada Education Savings Program, the tuition tax credit, and and so forth. So, so I, I want to commend you for that, because often you have groups that may make suggestions of, of further investment without maybe talking about expenditure reductions or revenue increases. So um, so I, I certainly would think that the programs that you spoke about would be worth looking at, and, and uh, I commend you for doing that exercise. Senator, um, I know that uh, your group has really uh, focal, has, a, has, a, has in its report a focal point on uh, trying to establish uh, anchors for uh, determining our financial sustainability and health. So maybe speak a little bit as to why that's important and what they are. Yes. Yeah, sure. Um, clearly, um, our group formed a, a consensus uh, on the we might be losing you a little. The following: uh, one is that uh, our, our our debt service costs. You're back. We we lost your connection you hear for me? a sec, Senator. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So you're uh, good now. So you, we have a. T I'm I'm sorry. Uh, so we have a, a what's called the Dodge Rule after David Dodge, who suggested that our debt service should not be higher than 10%. We have in the past had a higher debt service cost, and that led to a very difficult time for the government of Canada. But in addition to that, we feel that there should be a ceiling on direct program expenditures. Uh, which uh, we suggest 15%. We're happy to have that debate. After the program review of uh, of the uh, Chrétien government, we were below 13%. So this gives us some wiggle room from uh, from that point of view. Uh, but it's also lower, obviously, than we are in the pandemic period. So a fiscal framework that can be one that uh, markets are, uh, are uh, know that the government of Canada is committed to will help on the confidence side because confidence is the is the is the fuel of growth and and investment. Uh, we also, uh, like Catherine, suggest some revenue sources, including the HST increase of which I spoke, uh, but also uh, uh, the need for um, stronger uh, enforcement of existing uh, measures uh, and compliance issues, uh, which uh, have. Um, uh, uh, reported uh, significant uh, revenue um, gaps uh, in in 
in compliance issues. Uh, I, th I think we need to have this conversation. I probably would, would be a little more uh, conservative than some in terms of fiscal framework, uh, but let's have a conversation and reach an agreement and understanding a shared set consensus around which level, what level of government uh, we should, uh, we, we can have a sustainable basis to, to and move on from there. Uh, as I said, without a framework, uh, you will not have uh, the confidence that is necessary for uh, investment attraction and high uh, labor market performance. Well, perhaps if the four of us in the next kind of 14 minutes were able to come to that consensus, we'd be doing Canada a great <laughs> service here. Uh, we have different perspectives on this uh, on this panel, to say the least. So maybe, maybe that's what we'll have to do for next time, uh, Senator. Uh, at least I certainly want to give you a chance to speak to this. Um, but also, and, and maybe with your Lisa Rate uh, hat on and not the coalition hat on, just with all the experiences that you've had over the years, I'd also just be curious, because this brings up a bit of the, the sort of conundrum of governing. It's it's the short term versus the long term, and, and both are very relevant, short term pressures. And, and, and with a crisis, that certainly is intensified. There are fires to put out all the time. There are things that you need to address right away, but then also you need to make the right decisions for the long term. So even if you don't mind speaking a bit, because you've been around that table uh, and, and you know exactly all those types of pressures and what, what, what come from it. So maybe speak about that sort of dynamic as well. I certainly will, thanks very much. Uh, starting with the coalition, within that 115 groups, there are, there are varying opinions on the fiscal side of it, what should be done, what shouldn't be done. So therefore, where we land on this is, that you need to make sure you're working on economic growth all the time in order to be able to sustain an economy so that if something does happen, for example, an increase in interest rates, that impacts your ability uh, to do debt repayment. Um, that makes sense in accordance with you know, Senator Harder's um, um, metric, the Dodge rule. I like that, by the way, the Dodge rule. I like that, that concept. Um, that makes a lot of sense to us. So focus on economic growth because you never know what's gonna come down the pipe and taking off the coalition hat very clearly so that I don't get in any trouble. I, I would say this, um, I don't know what your observation is, Brian, but my observation over the past number of years is that governments react to crisis, and when they react to crisis, they may not actually get it right. And that's my concern. So both Ms. Scott and Senator Harder mentioned uh, that that pivotal budget from, from Jean Chrétien and, uh, and uh, um, Paul Martin, where they did program review and it had a huge impact on, on everything around it, quite frankly. I mean, that, was, that happened because we were gonna be rated by an outside rating company as being basically third world country because our economics were out of control. So you end up with having a reaction to that that really was felt across the country. Um, for the most part, Canadians, were content that they knew that they had to pay down their debt and deficit and they may not have liked it everybody pitched in to get it done in my case um i to give you the granular point of view stuff uh, you know important measures on regulation of safety rail safety only happened after we had a disaster in lac megantic so my point is we want to make sure that we have our eye on the ball on economic growth and that you're doing something every day to try to make sure that you are ready and prepared for when something comes along, like a COVID, like a disaster, that you can you can actually weather it without making a knee-jerk decision that's going to put you in a worse position going forward. So that's kind of my experience uh, point of view on, on uh, how governments do not handle crises well. And it's not to say that the government hasn't done a good job on COVID. It, it has nothing to do with that, but I'm sure that they made decisions that if they were in a different position or better prepared, if we were all better prepared for COVID, maybe we wouldn't have been making the decisions that we made. I think it's a fascinating point, Lisa, and I, and I think that this panel will hopefully serve a bit as, as a, a way in which government and decision makers can start to think about the important and, and the long-term and start to read all of your reports and, and follow the work that you're doing. So a few more questions as, as we are arriving on time, but, but there are a few other quick things I'd like to, to cover. So one is, uh, Senator, you, you covered this and, and it's gonna be under the theme of collaboration. Uh, interestingly, the three efforts that you're putting forward, uh, your groups are putting forward is very much 
uh, examples are very much examples of uh, collaboration, which I think we would all agree is needed, was needed during the pandemic, and is going to be needed moving forward. So, so Senator, I want to start with a specific one in the theme of collaboration, the the cooperative federalism element of of the report of the group of senators. I I thought was uh, interesting and compelling, and and one thing that I just want to point out is the idea that when you look at, and I think Catherine, your, your alternative, well, the group, um, your group's alternative budget also recognizes this, that, that it looks like the federal government that has taken on the realm of trying to deal with the pandemic more so than the provinces. Um, so, so Senator, I would be very curious if, uh, if you're still with us, Senator, I mean, we might've <laughs> lost you. I think uh, cool. Didn't like where the question was going, so he's just like, I'm out of here. Uh, there he <laughs> is. Oh, there he is, all right. Uh, Senator, yeah, just co cooperative federalism. I was just mentioning how the, it seems like the feds have taken up a lot of the fiscal responsibility to get through the pandemic uh, more so than the provinces. So just curious as to, as to your thoughts, whether maybe you would agree, and, and, and if so, what does that mean moving forward? Well, Brian, the, the federal government, um, if we didn't have the spending power uh, and the capacity to spend, we would not have had a COVID response that was coherent in Canada. So I have no problem with the government of Canada using the spending power to, in a sense, help uh, coordinate and manage the COVID. But I would also point out that if the provinces weren't engaged as they have been over the course of this whole pandemic, uh, 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 we would not have had uh, the degree of attention at the, at the micro level that is necessary. Now, Ms. Scott raised issues around long-term care facilities and the slowness of the response in some jurisdictions. I, I get that, but the government of Canada would not necessarily have been faster if it had been a federal government's action alone. So by nature of Canada, we have to have a degree of cooperation at the federal, provincial, territorial level uh, that other jurisdictions don't. And we achieve good things when we do. Think of the, uh, of the Pearson era, uh, which was the, the gold star uh, era of, of cooperative federalism. I'd like to see some of that returned so that there can be a sense of shared objectives and each jurisdiction aligning within their area of competence on, on uh, targets and measurable targets that we can agree on. Otherwise, we won't, we won't send the message to either Canadians that we have our act together or frankly, the global market uh, where uh, Canada's performance, as I indicated earlier, has been um, uh, uh, not as, as robust as it needs to become to achieve the objectives we wish. Well, Senator, very interestingly that you use that example because in the alternative budget, uh, Catherine, if I, if I may quote, it speaks of the, the Pearson-led, which the Pearson Center is obviously very happy to hear about all this, <laughs> the Pearson-led liberal government was returned in minority form Working with the NDP, that government implemented transformative public policies such as national universal health care system, a public pension, pension plan, and more affordable university tuition. It serves as a striking example of what minority governments open to cooperating for the common good can achieve. So, Catherine, maybe uh, to speak of, of that, uh, that principle that uh, Senator just mentioned. That's right, 100%. We actually look to the past and see these tremendous examples. Uh, uh, we're wholeheartedly in favor of a more cooperative form of federalism than we've seen on display of late. You know, uh, our, our report was, I, when I talk about long-term care, the argument is not that the federal government should get into the business of delivering long-term care services, but the federal government does have a role, certainly a constitutional role, in ensuring equitable and fair and just service provision across the country, which we haven't seen. And so whether we look at the new child care agreements that are going forward or long-term care, these particular things, I think we're really getting into the nitty gritty of like, how do we create that basket of services, looking at the regional unique, you know, obviously what it looks like in Newfoundland will look much different than it does in the, in the territories and the like. Um, how do we create much more robust structures to create that? We, you know, really the, the refrain these days is provincial premiers, and I know certainly speaking, you're saying, show us the money. Uh, and, you know, we're in this point, partly back to the Chrétien budget, where there were no strings attached. I mean, that was the quid pro quo. We're going to gut your provincial budgets, but that's okay, because we're going to let you do whatever you want. 
you know, I, I don't think that served Canadians well. And I say that as someone who's dealt with the long-term care system in the province of Ontario that has massive structural problems and like uh, not much of a home care system to speak of. So I think Canadians demand and do deserve a unified high quality service provisions. And I think the federal government has a really important role as get befit to its spending power to create national standards, supports in the form national uh, human resource human resource strategies um, that are really important to raising the quality and equity of the services that we deliver across the country. So I think this is the time to have that conversation across a range of service areas. Well, thank you, Catherine. Lisa, we have uh, time for one more. You, you get like a minute, just like question period, you're used to that. So, <laughs> so Lisa is gonna be with your two hats again. Yeah. Uh, so multifaceted question. So the first would be in the political realm of collaboration. I, we, I'm sure everyone listening would love to hear what you think of that. And then the second one, maybe with the coalition hat on, would be more about uh, the, the groups that you brought together uh, with this coalition and, and specifically the dynamic of business, working with government business, working with NGOs. Yeah. And here I'll plug in the Pearson Center is a is a happy member of the coalition. Uh, so so maybe speak about that collaboration and why that's important. Start with the second one first, Brian. Um, it's really important to to understand that the project that we're involved in is uh, 115 organizations talking to one another and not necessarily providing information to a Senate committee or to a parliamentary committee, or to something being held by the Business Council of Canada. These roundtables and these discussions are happening amongst the members, and the members come to an agreement and then put out what they believe is uh, advice to whoever wants to listen to it, along with the metrics to go with it. And the goal is to keep economic growth on the agenda and making sure that it's being worked on. The why is well established. The how um, happens by virtue of all of these reports that we've already seen, and, and it's for the policymakers to track the best the best path. But for for goodness sake, just track a path is I think what the the cry is. Um, I would say that also with coalition hat on. One of the discussions we had around economic growth was taking down the trade barriers between provinces. Now I'm sure. Brian, you can give us a lot of discussion on, on that because you sat at those tables. But um, and ideally, I'd like to see that conversation happen. But I also believe fundamentally, and I could see that coming into the spring, that the negotiations with the provinces is all going to be about transfers 100%. And that is going to be something that's going to take up a lot of their time and their bandwidth. And they're going to have to deal with that. After that, I would surely would like to see more economic discussion uh, federal, provincial, territorial, everybody involved. I think that would make the most sense. Well, thank you for that. Thank you to the three of you. What a wonderful discussion. And, and you were all uh, excellent as always and very much appreciate the time that you put in. But we also uh, want to say a thank you to each of your groups because I know that you're here representing uh, different groups and, and we thank all of them for the efforts that they're putting forward to raise the discourse and and participate in the in the conversation about what the economic recovery is going to look like how we're going to make it more inclusive sustainable and fair so very much appreciate the the insights that you shared with the audience today uh, merci beaucoup à nos panelists merci à vous tous et toutes d'avoir écouté notre panel the pearson center as you know is in the midst of uh three days of of webinars so please uh, go and check out the website to see if there's something that would be of, an in, of interest to you. And of course, we have one that's going to be following up with Andrew uh, making the transition for us in the next uh, in the next minute or so. As you can see, other people signing in for the, ne <laughs> the next uh, the next panel here. They're they're going to get their webcams set up straight, but it's all good. So, Andrew, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian Gallant, for that wonderful panel. Thank you, Lisa Raitt, uh, Catherine Scott, and Senator Peter Harder. That was amazing. Um, the first time the three of you have, have talked about these reports in one in one seminar and one location, and I think we've had a lot to learn. Um, these these videos will keep playing for the next while, and I think lots of people will find this very interesting. So thanks so much um, to our audience hanging there as the as the next panel begins to come online. Hello, Sean Strickland.
Hi, Andrew. It's James here. I'm having some camera challenges here, as you can see. Hello, James. We can see something there. You can see oh, the wall. My you. camera's facing the wrong way, and I'm not just sure how to. Yeah, this is a, a regular problem with MP's uh, cameras, so you're not the first one. There's something about your setup. Um, <clears throat> Senator Clément, bonjour, bienvenue. James Scagnac, bonjour. Hi, Andrew. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you very well. Senator, Perfect. can we hear you? Bonjour, tout le monde. Bonjour. Yeah, oui, c'est excellent. Yeah. And Sean, can we hear you? Good morning, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think we can okay. hear you now. Great. So the audience, uh, hang in there. We'll get uh, we'll get started in the next minute or two. There, now you can see me. There, James, we can see you just perfectly now. Are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, and hear you good. Okay, I'm tucked away in a little Perfect, closet yes. here. Perfect, I think we're all set to go. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope it's a safe one, and, uh, and they don't come and drag you in for a vote any, any moment. I told them this is more important than any vote. Excellent, excellent, <laughs> gotta have priorities. Okay, we'll get going. Um, I will just uh, introduce the session and introduce you. Uh, then James will take you through the um, through the discussion, and I'll be back at the end, towards the end, uh, to help with the Q and A that comes in from the audience. So, uh, welcome back to you, the audience, to Agenda 2022, the Pearson Center Fall Conference and Priorities for the New Parliament and Government. Um, we now switch to a different but related topic to the one you had just now. We're going to be talking about climate change and energy policy. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Um, we, we mentioned the sustaining sponsors at the start of the session, but I also want to mention the, the sponsors for today for this conference, which include uh, Bruce Power, Canada's Building Trades Unions, and Mr. Charles Coffey. Thank you for their uh, support because they make these uh, sessions possible and make, make and ensure that they are free to, to attend. Um, a lot of people are attending the session today. We then post these on, on our YouTube channel and we find that about three to four times the number of people will watch them in the days and weeks after this. So just briefly on the format, we have a discussion with a panel for about 40 minutes uh, that James Maloney will lead. Um, so please, and after that, we'll get to questions towards the end of the hour. So please, uh, to the audience, please use your question box and send in your questions. We'll get to as many as we can. And we end the session at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, without further delay, let me quickly introduce our panel for today. Sean Strickland is Executive Director of Canada's Building Trades Unions, which is comprised of the, of the provincial building trades unions from across the country. A large network of men and women who literally build Canada and now are in the process of building the green infrastructure. Uh, I should add that Sean is also regional councillor for the region of Waterloo, Ontario, where he addresses various issues related to today's topic from a municipal perspective. James Coe, Development Officer, President of Operational Services at Bruce Power. He leads the company's work in some key innovative areas, namely their medical isotope business, net zero initiatives, power trading, business development, and Indigenous community economic partnerships. He also chairs Canada, the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council and the Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario. And Senator Bernadette Clément is in one of the newest senators and is a member of the Independent Senators Group. She was mayor of Con Cornwall, Ontario before her appointment and was the first black woman to be a mayor in her province. As mayor, she provided considerable leadership in the city's work on climate change. Uh, she's a lawyer by training and has focused on working for injured workers, in margin, marginalized groups. Senator, congratulations on an inspired appointment. Uh, this discussion, this discussion will be will be moderated by James Maloney, member of Parliament for Etobicoke Lakeshore. He's been chair of the Natural Resources Committee of the House of Commons 
for the last two parliaments, starting at the beginning of 2016. He's also a lawyer by training, and I'm pleased to say he's been a great supporter of our work at the Pearson Center and has moderated various panels. Um, I want to welcome James Maloney, James Goniak, and Sean Strickland back to the Pearson podium. Madame la Sénatrice Clément, c'est la première fois que vous êtes avec nous aujourd'hui et je vous souhaite, je, je vous souhaite la bienvenue. Merci. And I hope that you will join us. Merci. I hope you will join us from time to time in your new role in the upper chamber. Um, I will return later during the session to help with the Q&A from the audience. Uh, so with that, over to you, James Maloney. Andrew, thank you. Everybody can hear me okay? I'm Okay, great. I apologize. I'm, I appear to be in a little room, and that is because I am in a little room. I'm actually uh, sitting just outside of the chamber in the House of Commons, and uh, I snuck off and found a room where I could plug in my computer and do this and have this discussion with you. So first off, Andrew, thank you uh, to you and to the Pearson Center for inviting me back. Um, I didn't think I did a very good job last time, but apparently it wasn't as bad as I thought because you've chosen to have me return. So I'm grateful for that. And I'm really excited to be here with uh, the three panelists. Uh, James, I know you and I know each other. We've had many occasions to deal each other, deal with each other. Um, Sean uh, and S Senator Clement, I, I feel like I know you, although I don't really. Um, the reason for that is, well, in your case, Senator, I'm also, I was a practicing lawyer for 20 years before I went into politics, but I did sit on Toronto City Council briefly. So uh, the two of you have that in common. And I say briefly, I sat on Toronto City Council for uh, a period of five months only. I was appointed in June of 2014 when my local councillor uh, chose to run provincially. As I joke regularly, I was I was there long enough to get to know everybody, but long, not long enough for people to develop a dislike for me. So it worked out quite well. Um, but having said all that, look, I'm, I'm very excited to be here with you today. Uh, you know, the fact that I'm here able to do this today, we're, we're still uh, on the uh, dealing with COVID and this pandemic, uh, but we're able to do these things by Zoom uh, and do them virtually. And that's, uh, that's actually quite positive because we can keep moving these very important discussions forward. So today we are here to talk about uh, climate change and energy policy, policy two things that um, are critical to Canada's future, uh, Canada's present for that matter. I mean, if you just look what's going on around us across the country, you only need to turn on any news station for 30 seconds to uh, understand the significance of both of these issues. Uh, I've been involved, as Andrew said, I've been the chair, of, I've been had the good fortune to, to be the chair of the Natural Resource Committee for the past six years. So I've worked with some pretty amazing people and that's how I got to know James. And I do have to give a shout out, of course, to uh, Bruce Power's relationship with Kinetrix, which is in my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore. And I know we'll be hearing more about the medical isotope issue later, I'm sure. Okay, so enough people didn't uh, tune in to hear me talk. So I'm going to move on to the topic at hand. As I said, we're here talking about climate change and energy policy. We're just coming off of uh, COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, it's on top of everybody's minds. People were following it very closely. Canada played a, a prominent role uh, in the conference and leading many discussions there on a variety of topics, including things like carbon pricing and uh, emission targets and encouraging other countries around the world to uh, follow some of the positive things that we have done. So I'm going to start with uh, a topic about the role of cities. Um, you know, I come from Toronto. I continue to work with Mayor John Tory on a weekly basis. I know how, and this is the thing, to, just to frame that, that question a little bit, you know, the climate change issue isn't something that's going to be solved by the federal government or the provincial government or the municipal government or the private sector. It's going to be, you know, addressed because everybody sits down, puts their partisan swords down and says, okay, this is what we got to do. How can we best achieve our goals? And that's why it's important we're having this discussion, you know, from a municipal standpoint. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, you were here, but I'll start with you, Senator Clement. You you were the mayor of Cornwall for, for uh, a number of years. Um, and I should I should add to what I just said. It's not just big cities that play a role. It's all municipalities. 
Um, and so maybe you can share some of your thoughts on role cities do play in uh, dealing with uh, climate change. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And um, it's, a, it's a real honor to be here. Yes, I was mayor until uh, June of this year uh, of Cornwall, Ontario. So a beautiful, small city of 48,000 people along the shores of the beautiful St. Lawrence River. We have a budget of approximately $200 million. And I say that because budgets are important in conversations around climate change and climate policy. Um, prior to being mayor, I was a councillor for three terms. So I've been, I've been in the municipal arena for uh, a very long time. I have to say Cornwall, you know, like many towns in Ontario, has a, a very proud industrial past. But when our pulp and paper mill closed in 2006, we had to find a way to redefine ourselves as a community, right? We were no longer this pulp and paper mill town. A lot of our industry along the St. Lawrence River was closed. And we were choosing to define ourselves along protecting the environment, along becoming climate champions and turning towards the St. Lawrence River to, to redefine ourselves. So this is um, very much uh, a community conversation around climate change. And it really started with, well, it was sort of triggered by managing water. You know, we had basement floodings in 2010 and we were still talking about the one in 100 year storms. And then in 2013, there was another storm and there were more basement floodings. And so we started to, to say, I think we need to have serious communication with the community, um, increase community literacy around the impact of climate change on uh, city budgets and, and having a focus around our strategic priorities to include resiliency. Um, in our budgets. And this was difficult because we had to have frank conversations about taxes, right? Um, we were in this climate of keeping taxes low, but we need to understand that the investment around climate change is real. The investment around resiliency is real and property taxes are not going to cut it to cover those expenses. So we went about developing partnerships with local organizations grassroots organizations like the St. Lawrence River Institute, like Cornwall Transition Plus around, you know, community literacy, skills around reusing, cooking, gardening, just making sure that people were understanding the impact that climate change was going to have and having them be able to participate and put pressure on their municipal their municipal partners municipal politicians are the closest to the people i don't want to insult federal and provincial levels of government uh, municipal is not as glamorous but we're the ones that are close the rubber hits the road in terms of our budgets people uh, know who we are will engage with us very easily and so we have a responsibility to have those conversations and to lead community in understanding what pressures and we need to partner with them like we need to go to our government partners in the province and federal levels and we need community with us to put pressure on those levels of government so there is very much a non-partisan discussion taking place uh, at municipal levels and partnerships and collaboration i was listening to the former uh, the previous uh, session, and it's all about collaboration and partnerships. So municipalities are good at that. That's our expertise, that closeness to the public. Uh, and um, so that's where we are. And um, I'll sort of offer those comments to, to kickstart the conversation. Thanks, Senator. Maybe, you know, that's, you, you've mentioned a couple of things that uh, struck a chord with me. One is, I mean, Traditional industries are changing uh, in municipalities around the country. Uh, you know, the the one I remember that once in a hundred year storm a few years ago, and then the next one. Well, the story I always tell, you know, I live my riding's on the lake shore of Lake Ontario, and about five years ago we had the highest water levels in a hundred years, and the next year we had the highest water level in a hundred years, but for last year. You know, so and it's it's all of these things that used to happen. There were one-off things are now regular exactly. occurrences, and people are starting to become aware of that. So, uh, municipalities, and you know, the the partnership we talk about applies across the board. And Sean, you 
you know the 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 trades are a big part of that uh you have you you're a counselor in waterloo so maybe i'll sort of steer this conversation over to you because a big a big part of the transition to clean energy and addressing climate change is transit and waterloo whereas it used to be a long way from toronto it's now you know i don't want to get anybody in waterloo upset with me but it's more it's becoming a suburb of toronto in reality and transit uh, is becoming a big a, a big reason for that well um i wouldn't go as far to say a suburb of toronto that certainly would uh uh, get a few people in Waterloo region upset, you know, with the big smoke down the road trying to take over everything. But uh, we, we, you know, we're, we're, you know, just talking about the region of Waterloo before I, I you know, kind of dovetail into the trades a little bit. But I think, you know, further to the to the center's comments uh, and the introduction of the panel, I, I think that there is a, a great role that municipalities can play in in mitigating climate change and also preparing for a net zero economy through through policy, but also through investment in infrastructure. So I think there's there's kind of two things that municipalities need to consider. One is that you have to make sure you have the right kind of infrastructure to deal with these increasingly number of severe weather events. And then at the same time, you have to invest in preventative member uh, measures to reduce, along with the federal and provincial governments, to reduce the uh, frequency of these severe weather events going into the future. And, and one of the big things that municipalities have at their disposal is planning. And you don't really think about planning as a way to address climate change. But, you know, uh, James, you, you referenced uh, Waterloo and transit, and we invested uh, almost a billion dollars in a light rail transit system. Uh, we started the construction project 2013. It was fully operational two years ago. And that is a great people mover, and it's going to be integrated with uh, Metro, uh, Metrolinks, and also with Go. So we have all way, all all day Go service to to Toronto to help with those economic uh, relationships. But really, the reason we put that into place is as a planning tool, because we said as a as a regional municipality, predominantly made up of of three urban centers: Kitchener, Waterloo, and Cambridge, and then outside outlying townships that we wanted to protect our our rural urban balance of life. And in order to do that, we wanted to grow up rather than out. So often what happens in cities, and we're growing, and Ontario is a growing, Canada is a growing country, the economy is growing. The tendency is to go out and acquire more and more agricultural land through expropriation or whatever. And then in order to service that land, uh, you need more transportation corridors. You need you need more cars on the road. And so we said there's a better way. We'll make that investment with the support of money from the federal government and um, the uh, provincial government. And we funded a third of ourselves from the local tax base. Many of these projects now are being funded 100% between the province and uh, federal governments. And by growing up rather than growing out, you're able to protect uh, farmland, which is uh, which is a great benefit, but but also reduce the requirement on uh, increased transportation networks and reduce the number of cars on the road. Uh, the other thing that's related to that that I that I would comment on is that that water and wastewater infrastructure. I mean, and that's really the reasons why cities came together and, and governments were formed and taxes were put into places for public sanitation to make sure you have clean drinking water and that you manage the wastewater. And so we have infrastructure that's hundreds, you know, over a hundred years old. Like, and you see this on the news periodically when they, they do a dig in Montreal or Toronto or in even in Waterloo region, we found when, when we were building the LRT, we found uh, wooden, like literally wooden water pipes, which no one, had any idea of, but that infrastructure that exists today, that that pipe um, is very inefficient. And uh, the largest consumer or the largest energy b bills we have as a municipality is our water and wastewater operations. It's not our buildings, it's not our fleet, it's our water and wastewater operations. And they're very inefficient because you lose so much water uh, on either end through leakage. And when that happens, you're expending an inordinate amount of energy to process the water and wastewater uh, for a certain percentage that never makes it through the pipe. And so there's a there's a whole um, raft of of investments that could be made in traditional infrastructure, including waste and wastewater, to help reduce our carbon footprint. So there's just a couple of comments from a municipal perspective, uh, James. Thanks. Great, thanks, Sean. Now, James, I know. Uh... <clears throat> 
Bruce Power has a good relationship with all levels of government, including including municipalities. Um, as, as I pointed out, you've got uh, a partnership project with Kinetrix in my riding with Tobacco Lakeshore. Uh, I don't know if you want to touch it. We're going to we're going to get on to renewables more specifically and nuclear in particular, but I don't know if you want to touch uh, on the municipal issue before we get into that with any specifics. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I uh, first, firstly, James, uh, thanks for uh, thanks thanks for having me and for all your support uh, with uh, Kinetrix and medical isotopes. And I have to kind of call Sean Strickland out because Sean usually runs around telling everybody that Toronto is a suburb of Waterloo. So I I, I think you, you probably have it a little more accurate. So um, no, the only thing I would say is is um, one of the concerns that I have with how these types of whether it's climate change initiatives, economic recovery initiatives, co fighting COVID initiatives roll out is, what can happen is a lot, whether it's a municipality, whether it's a private sector company, whether it's a community group, is people very quickly gather, what is the top priority of the government? And how do we go after funding we want and make sure we use the right buzzwords? You know, so coming out of COVID, it was economic recovery and you'll still see some people talk about that climate change is the issue and the list goes on and on and on and the same projects get framed in the same way and i think james one of the things that we're going to have to be really careful about is i think uh, uh the senator said this best funds are limited so when we're looking at an issue like climate change we have to make sure you know you could argue that any fu uh, any project has a climate change benefit or an economic recovery benefit the issue is with limited funds how do you surgically put them in the areas of the highest impact and I think that's a real challenge for policymakers is because everybody will show up and tell you why this benefits climate change or why this benefits economic recovery. And, and for governments, that is very tough to decipher. And what we have to be careful about is that we don't end up with a, such a broad array of things and we move everything 1% a month and we don't put a dent in anything. So maybe I'll cover more about that when we get into the discussion on, on uh, clean energy like nuclear and renewables. But I see that as one of government's uh, biggest challenges in terms of allocating those very precious resources. Well, you're absolutely right. All right, well, why don't, why don't we jump into that? Let's, let's talk about clean energy and nuclear energy in particular. Uh, I will say this about uh, nuclear energy. It's, I mean, if you ask the average citizen in Ontario what percentage of power in Ontario comes from nuclear energy, 90% of them will be wrong unless they're familiar with it and working in the field because it's, you know, it's over 60%. When I tell people that, they're, they're typically shocked. Nuclear energy um, is an important part of our renewable energy going forward currently, uh, and it's an important part of so many, so, you know, the just transition and the transition to clean energy. Uh, and we we see that in Ontario and other provinces too, whether you want to talk about small modular reactors or whatever the case may be. But, you know, clean energy and renewable energy is uh, something that, and to your point, it's something you look at it through that lens, whether you're building infrastructure or you're setting policy or regardless of what you're doing. And you guys are at the forefront of this. So uh, thank you for that, first of all. But why don't you take us through a little bit about what's uh, what is happening on the nuclear front and for some of our viewers. Yeah, no, uh, happy to, and always appreciate James, your support of the nuclear industry and the role that, that we play as part of a balanced energy mix. I always say it's not about, are you choosing between nuclear, wind, storage, hydro? It's really all the above. If we're gonna fight climate change, we need an all the above uh, uh, type approach. You know, if I go back to sort of first principles and say, you know, a lot of people would also be surprised if you say, what is one of the top 10 climate change reduction initiatives that has been successful in the around the world? over the last decade. Many people would be surprised to hear that it was the phase out of coal fired power in, in Ontario, one of the most successful emissions reduction programs. 70% of that energy came from the site that I'm sitting on today, the Bruce Power site. We were able to return units to service, to modernize them, to enhance their output. That was 70% seven, seven, uh, of the energy needed to phase out coal. So. You know, anybody that thinks you can get to net zero without nuclear uh, doesn't have a credible plan to get to net zero. We need an all the above strategy. And I think, you know, we need to get away from an ideological debate. You know, maybe I look at this too much like a business person, but one of the things I often say to people, James, is sometimes when you work in the nuclear industry, and this was not the case with Minister O'Regan, I got to give him a lot of credit. Um, I sometimes do feel that this way with the current environment minister. 
um, to call a spade a spade. But sometimes in the nuclear industry, we feel like we're asked to pay for the wedding, but not invited to the party. And what's really important for us is that we're seen as part of that mix. You know, our organization two weeks ago, we just announced the first ever green bond for nuclear power, a $500 million green bond where, where our investment was recognized as a, as a green investment. And so the biggest mistake we as a nuclear industry make is we sometimes get combative with other sources of electricity and we don't need to do that. You know, I think Senator, you talked about unity and the importance of people coming together we need that in the fight against climate change. And so what I would say is we shouldn't look at the nuclear debate in isolation, just like we shouldn't look at the renewable debate in isolation. We should look at this and say, where do we need to get to with emissions? And it's a very simple number. And if you want to get from where you are today to that number, how do you close the math? And I believe if we look at closing the math, there's enough for everybody. And we will actually not be having a debate about nuclear versus this versus that. We're going to be having a discussion about how do we move quickly and actually get this done. You know, um, you know, I respect Sean Strickland and his team at the Building Trades because you know, guys like me can make all sorts of commitments on how quickly we're going to return a reactor to operation or quickly we're going to build a hydro dam. It's it's the men and women of the Canadian and Ontario Building Trades that make that happen. And every day we're talking about this and not taking action is a day that those folks aren't actually doing the work that gets us to the end point. But I will tell you, and, and James and uh, and many of your colleagues who have nuclear suppliers in your riding, I think you've done a fantastic job of communicating those facts because when we communicate those facts, um, we tend to get a, a lot of support. And what I'd say is all political parties in the House of Commons have pockets of people who are not, not there on nuclear now. And that's just a reality in a democracy. And we need to reach out to those people and, and keep it focused on facts and have an inclusive discussion. Thanks. Yeah, I, my, in my experience, it's the less you know about the industry, the more concerned you are about it. Because as soon as you learn Absolutely. a little bit about it, you realize how safe it is. Um, Absolutely. And so, you know, education is a key component to moving forward on that. All right, well, Sean, over to you then. I, you know, back to the suburb of Toronto. So apparently, I did hit a hot button there. Um, <laughs> I didn't no, know that. No, that's okay. It's all <laughs> but, right. But uh, look, the building trades, I mean, as, as James has said, I mean, this is a big part of, there's, there's jobs to be had here. And people, when people talk about clean energy, they think it's an economic killer, when in fact, it's quite the opposite. And it's, again, as soon as you roll up your sleeves and start digging into the stuff, you realize the huge opportunity there is. Yeah, absolutely, James. And no, that's okay if I showed a little um, a little sensitivity around the Toronto comment. You know, being a Waterloo region all my life, we're a little sensitive to those kinds of things. But that's okay. And James Scott might say, you know, that Waterloo region is, you know, quickly turning into a suburb of Bruce County. So, you know, there's a lot of people in Waterloo region who go to work in Bruce County all the time. Uh, because of all the great projects that they're doing up there at uh, the nuclear plant at Douglas Point. So just, I think it's important to put in context because, you know, the building trades, we get a lot of work in the oil and gas sector. And so, uh, and they're good construction and maintenance jobs in the oil and gas sector. And and oil and gas isn't going away anytime soon. Like we're still going to need a, uh, you know, a very robust oil and gas sector just to, to, so just to manage and provide the oil and gas products to keep our economy going. So it's like you just can't turn off the switch and all of a sudden we're at net zero. And most you know, forward thinking people recognize that. But just to give you some context, there was a recent uh, shutdown at Irving Oil in St. John, New Brunswick, 3,500 workers for like eight weeks. Uh, shutdown season's coming up in Fort McMurray. 10,000 workers are going to need this spring from like May to August in, in Fort McMurray. And these these are good paying jobs with pension and health and welfare benefits that are, you know, sustained middle class families and a Canadian way of life. And so it's really important that when we talk about this transition to net zero and, and James is talking about closing the math, well, we're closing the math there are people and workers are going to be affected by this. And this is why we talk about it. And I appreciate, you know, MP Maloney, you mentioned just transition. That's really something that, that we need we need to look at. And, and in April, there was a TD Bank report that came out. It said the oil and gas sector between now and 2050, as we go through just trans, as we go through transition to net zero, we could lose 50 to 75 percent of all our workers in that sector. And, and that's upwards of 400,000 jobs. So this is serious. Uh, government and industry and labor need to manage this. We don't want to repeat 
what happened in Ontario and, and to a certain degree Quebec in the 80s and 90s, we went through a deindustrialization. We lost all those jobs. Those jobs never came back. Uh, most people would say it wasn't very well managed from a policy perspective. And so we really need to have that kind of tripartite approach uh, to help with this transition to net zero. And oftentimes it's, you know, people in this panel are very familiar with the new energy sources of, of the future, but oftentimes people think about when we go to net zero, that it's wind and solar. Well, wind and solar is part of the mix, but as you rightly point out in Ontario, it's 60% nuclear already, but wind and solar aren't, you're not gonna be able to build a sustainable uh, economy, uh, uh, you know, a thriving growing economy on that energy source alone. And so as we go through the transition, we need to think about nuclear energy. We need to think about small modular reactors. There's a cluster happening in New Brunswick right now with Arc Energy and Moltex and OPG as well in Ontario is looking at small modular reactors as a good solution. Uh, carbon sequestration, there's lots of activity happening in the uh, oil patch right now. Uh, consortiums and partnerships and strategic alliances are are being formed. Tax credits have been put into place to, to help with that transition to carbon sequestration. Hydrogen, hydrogen is another energy project of the future. But the challenge with these projects is that they're 10 to 15 years away. And so what do we do in the transition? Well, you know, I talk to my colleagues in Alberta and they say, we're happy to do the maintenance work, but you know, what we really need is we need significant infrastructure investment right now while the new technologies of hydrogen and carbon sequestration are being developed and commercialized, which isn't gonna happen for at least 10 years. And so in Alberta, I think we need to look at investments for the Hyperloop, the high-speed train service uh, between uh, Calgary and Edmonton, for example. Uh, in Saskatchewan, there's big potential for projects like the Tiefenbaker Tiefen Lake and irrigation. Saskatchewan already is doing carbon sequestration. So can we provide more tax incentives to support that already uh, functioning uh, ecosystem around carbon sequestration? In um, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, hydroelectricity. Uh, hydroelectricity is a fantastic form of clean energy. And we have an abundance of that in Canada. In Newfoundland and Labrador, we look at the projects like the Atlantic Loop. Uh, we look at uh, Gull Island. And so there's these large infrastructure projects that need to be part of the discussion to help workers make that transition from these traditional oil and gas jobs to the new energy jobs of the future, because it's going to take a while for these new energy jobs to get to the marketplace. Senator, did you want to jump in on that? You were... Yeah, well, there's so many points that uh, both of the other speakers made that I that I want to comment on. Um, on the issue of nuclear or any other um, source of energy, I think it is very important, um, as both of you said, that information is out there for community and transparency, right? So if people feel that they have credible sources of information and that the people giving them that information are being transparent, you're going to build trust. Um, and you're right, James, people uh, want to have nonpartisan conversations and they want to see all levels of gov government unify. We just did in Cornwall a climate survey just to go out to the public again and say, you know, how are you feeling about things? What are your ideas? They overwhelmingly said, we don't feel government leaders are doing enough. We want you to work together. Well, there's a clear messages there for us. Um, the problem with municipalities and the challenge we have is that we have to be all things to all people, right? We have to build arenas, we have to do snow removal, and we have to put climate change, you know, at the center of all of our policies. So, you know, James, your point is, is, is a good one that we need to focus because we can't afford to pay for everything. And we need to really identify the, the, the priorities that need our attention now and our investment now. So that's a bit of the tension that we feel within municipalities. And Sean, you're quite correct that it's, it's about planning right? Um, cities plan. We have waterfront plans. We have bike and pedestrian master plans. We plan. And so that is our strength. Um, just a little shout out to the city of Cornwall uh, just hired a sustainability planner uh, coordinator and we're now looking for a new environmental services division manager. Just putting it out there in case people want to uh, to apply. But the jobs are different now. 
right? So we mourned the losses of those jobs in the manufacturing sector. And now we're looking for, you know, uh, to recruit people with other skills to support all of these um, climate initiatives and all of the skills that it takes to put these things in place. Just one last comment on infrastructure to Sean's point. You know, we now want to go to composting. We're, we're late in getting to that because it's expensive, but we want to invest in our wastewater treatment plant to put in a co-digester so that we can take the organic waste and transform it into fertilizer and fuel, right? So these are things that our community is talking about. This is going to cost a lot. So we need um, partners all across the board. Uh, but pr particularly with province and federal government to to come to the table so that so that we do this because the community is demanding that we do this okay so there's there's two areas i want to sort of finish off with we've got about 10 minutes left before we can start taking questions from those watching but and we've talked about it a bit but the, the infrastructure piece and then i want to get into the partisan nature of the discussion because that's a pet peeve of mine and it drives me crazy um there's, there shouldn't be anything partisan about any of these discussions. My my view as a politician that we all want the same thing. We're just taking different routes to get there, and some people are going a little faster than others. That's all. But we all really ultimately want the same thing, and we lose sight of that too many times, unfortunately. But on the infrastructure piece, I mean, Sean, you mentioned it. Senator, you've mentioned it. James, you've talked about it. With where we are right now, infrastructure is, I mean, you know, renewing our infrastructure has, has, has been critical. But now it's it's you know we're it's urgent it's urgent I mean just look what's going on out in Western Canada right now so where do we put our resources where do all levels of government where do where should people focus what are the big infrastructure projects in the you know short to medium term because as you've all quite rightly pointed out you can't do everything uh, they're just it's just not practical there isn't enough money to do it also. Uh, where where do we start and where do where do we go? I don't know who wants to take that one up. I'm, I'm James, go ahead. I'm happy to start about that. And by the way, I, I agree a lot with the senator's comments. I, I you know, I always like to say I like politicians. Uh, I work with them of all all stripes. They work hard. Uh, they they really care about their community. Often, many of them are are giving up a lot of their personal time, tremendous personal sacrifice with their families, and you know sometimes we put them in such an unfair uh, set of expectations that it's like how could you ever do that job? Um, but in terms of your direct question, I think it's a really good one, and maybe I'll take a bit of a business approach to it. If let's say you are a large company and you want to invest, you want to have a large multi-year capital program and you want to expand your company and you want to expand your investments, typically what a company would do is they'd say, what are all of our options? And companies will go and develop five or 10 projects with knowing full well that in four or five years from now, only three of them will actually proceed. But that's what you do as a business, you develop options. Um, and, I, and I think that's a real struggle for government. Because what happens is if, if government supports infrastructure projects, and you know, I always like to say that the, that the first 30% of a project tends to be things like environmental permitting, public consultation, engineering. It tends to be a lot of stuff where you're actually not building the project. And so, you know, if governments could find a way to say, you know what, we don't need to make final decisions on all where our transmission is going to be what types of generation but we're going to spend money and develop options and then when we get to a point later say what options are we going to exercise now the problem in political space for that is for of the of the if you look at 10 projects let's say you progress with four you're politically going to be accused of throwing away money on six that never go anywhere but in the real world that's how things happen and i think the biggest problem for our leaders is when they get to decisions they don't have a lot of options and I think we need to look at option development, early engineering, early engagement with communities, indigenous peoples, early regulatory approvals, and let's understand the suite of projects that are actually viable. But the consequence is going to be that is we're going to have to get behind our leaders and say, you know, we're not going to criticize them if some of those projects don't progress, because that's all about progressing options. And I think that's one difference between the private sector and public sector that is very difficult. And I go back to my comment of liking politicians. I mean that very genuinely because 
Um, in private business, if you were a CEO and you had 10 options, but you only progress with four of them, they would think, wow, you were smart to develop that many options. In politics, people would say, what is wrong with you? You went and spent money on six projects that didn't go anywhere. And we have to change that dialogue. And that is the kind of area I think we can come together on. Yeah, I mean, the problem is, is the uh, the criticism about the six other projects mostly comes from other politicians. You know, it's not coming from the public, and they, or, right. and they they just they just you know fan the flames, and then the public jumps on board too. So, it's a it's a harder battle to uh, to engage in. Um, Sean, you had talked about some major infrastructure projects earlier. I mean, you you given all the hats you wear, you must have some strong views on this. Well, I, I think that, you know, to, to James' point, um, you know, the options, uh, I think, you know, from a business perspective, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Politically, it's, it's you know, much more difficult to do because, you know, I want this project for my riding. I want this project for my province. And so that dynamic, it's over, overlaid on it. And I, I, I think um, the minister, former Minister of Infrastructure, McKenna, started a infrastructure uh, assessment uh, kind of research project. I can't remember the exact title of it, uh, uh, you know, before the last election. And one of the recommendations we made around this, you know, infrastructure should not be partisan, it should be depoliticized, is that we should take a similar approach to what other countries do and allocate a certain percentage of GDP every year to infrastructure investment. And and what happens right now is it, it gets politicized. Like even during the pandemic, um, there was all kinds of money that was allocated and approved by the federal government for infrastructure projects, but they weren't flowing through to the cities and they weren't flowing through the provinces and they were held up at the provinces. So I was on call with, you know, highly uh, placed um, bureaucrats and also politicians in a couple of different provinces and saying, you know, we got guys who, and women are ready to go to work, but and this project's being approved by the municipality, but you can't get the money out the door. What's going on? And the federal government would say, well, it's the province's fault. And the provinces would say, well, it's the federal government's fault. And I would say, like, I don't really give a damn. Like, you guys need to f figure this out. And then, you know, one of the solutions was uh, Minister Freeland came through with, I can't remember the name of the fund, but provided some stimulus directly to municipalities and to cities for infrastructure spending which, you know, eliminated the log jam. And so, you know, I think just from a kind of like 30,000 foot level and and from a policy perspective that I think it'd be really good to be politicized and say, we're gonna spend this much of GDP from the federal government because you can't control what the provincial governments are gonna do. There are some provincial premiers right now who aren't spending a dime on infrastructure, even though there's, you know, federal money available, can't control that. But the federal government can control what percentage of GDP they're going to spend on infrastructure every year. And then also the industry is able to better plan for that. We'll know how much work is coming, how many workers we need, how many do we need to train, how many different trades. It just would be a much more uh, systemic, uh, thoughtful way to manage your infrastructure, I think is long overdue in Canada. Yeah, I don't disagree. So let, let's transition then over to the political side of it because, and Senator, you you can jump in as having some experience, you know, at the municipal level and now at the federal level. And just to back to what you said earlier, I'm not sure any level of government is as glamorous politically anymore. Um, <laughs> just, just to be just to be clear. Um, and James, over to you. You feel free to say you like politicians and they do good things as frequently as you want because we don't. Yes, hear that. please. Oh my gosh, my smile is huge. Ninety-five percent of them. I won't tell you who the five percent are that are not in there. <laughs> No, oh, but this part about you know working, and as I said earlier, it really bothers me because you see it between you know the first speech I ever made in the House of Commons, and the first one of the only speeches I ever made in Toronto City Council was you know uh, one party doesn't have a monopoly on good ideas any more than another idea has a monopoly on bad ideas. Ideas are not left or right or blue or red; they're good or bad. And if I've got a bad idea, tell me if I've got a, if you've got a good idea, I should tell you. But unfortunately, we get caught up in this you know, partisan world. And I'm not saying it's, you know, we do it as much as the, the other guy, but it costs uh, all of us because as you say, infrastructure projects and other initiatives get bogged down. And we've seen it in the last few years, in the last 18 months during COVID, we have these 
you know, disagreements, I'll use that word, between the federal and provincial governments and things aren't getting done because the timing of them. And I've, you know, I've had some big projects in my own riding and I've had different levels of government from different parties. I said, guys, we get this stuff done. There's credit to go around to everybody. Let's not fight over stuff. Let's just get it done. Um, but that doesn't always happen. And I'm not sure I don't I don't know how to solve that problem. I mean, Sean, you're you're right. We need to maybe sort of taking it out of the hands of the politicians to some extent might go some way to do that. But uh I guess it, it's up to the senator and I who are who are inside to try to push that uh, notion, but uh, it's not easy, I gotta tell you. I don't know, Senator, you must have lots of thoughts on this. Yes, I, I do. Um, and I think I think it all, all roads lead back to community and what, you know, that what their expectations are. They're going to keep all of us working together. They're going to we want them to demand that of us from a Senate perspective. I, I'd like to say that um, this past week we had two, three senators stand up and talk about launching inquiries. So not only does a senator review legislation, right, that's presented from the House, but we can also launch our own inquiries into issues. And we had Senator Simons and Senator Coyle stay, say that they wanted to launch some municipal inquiries around what are the climate solutions that can come directly from communities, from municipalities? Um, what are the issues that are concerning municipalities most uh, these days? And we're, we fully anticipate that that will center around climate change. And so I'm looking forward to the conversations we're going to have as senators, as independent senators, not partisan senators, senators who want to make sure that gov we're signaling to government that there needs to be partnerships between all the levels of government. Senator Simon um, com compared municipal governments to the Rodney danger field of politics, the one with the least amount of respect. <laughs> Somewhat I can relate to that. But at the same time, I think we're taking our place, right? Because our communities are telling us, we expect you mayors and councils to do your work. Um, and we expect you to bring your voices to all of those uh, levels of government. And so, you know, I think that the time is now and communities expect it. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right on that. Now, according to my uh, clock here, we have, uh, I think Andrew was going to lead us into some questions from some of the people who may have been watching. There you are, Andrew. Welcome back. You're Any on session. Okay. Um, you oh, sorry. I'm... You're good now. You're good now. Nope, now you're back on mute. He was good. Now you can hear me. Now we can hear you. There you go. Right? Okay, good. Okay. Sorry, fascinating session. We've had a few questions come in. Uh, the first is on just transitions. Could the panel talk a little more about how these how this can work? Uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Sean Strickland to start. Sure. Yeah. Th thank. Thanks for for that, Andrew. I, you know, just transition. Uh, there's been uh, effective models uh, put into place uh, for transition of economies. Uh, it was something similar to that happened for coal when coal-fired uh, uh, generating stations were were shut down. And so there's a there was a federal organization like a advisory body put together on that and in different European countries have had it as well. And so essentially the idea is we need to have labor, government and industry at the table uh, managing the transition uh, with input from each of those key stakeholders. We need to make sure that the appropriate training is in place uh, to help the workers transition to the new economies and the new energy sources of the future. We need to provide uh, the right kind of tax incentives uh, for business and, and uh, corporate Canada in the energy sector to make those kinds of investments into the new energy sources of the future. Uh, we need the government to also look at ways in which they can fast track the regulatory approval process, not circumvent the regulatory approval process. Uh, regula regulation's important, but to make sure we can fast track it because you know we're talking about uh, creating a, a new economy and new industries and providing uh, opportunities for workers. And we also need to provide tax incentives 
for workers to go to where the work is because we know you know all economic recovery is uneven it's uneven within provinces and across provinces and and we think it's really important to have a skilled trades workforce mobility tax deduction available so that where when workers are in an area of high unemployment they have the economic incentive to go to an area that has high demand right now that doesn't exist in canada so it impacts negatively our labor mobility so all of these things need to to come together to provide that kind of that menu options james options to help uh, our economy transition and make sure that workers aren't left behind thank you uh, sean uh, senator clement perhaps you can comment on the role of municipalities you mentioned the uh the pop and paper mills that closed down in your city. Yeah, Work. and you know, I, I just wanna say, we did have to mourn the loss of those jobs, you know? You have to be respectful of um, history and the work that went into building communities. And so there was a time where we had to, to adjust to that. Uh, and now, um, as, a, as a smaller municipality, we need to make sure that we have a workforce that is healthy, right properly housed we want to attract people to our small community not to compare not to compete with toronto we'll never do that but we have you know our share of needs in terms of uh, a workforce so municipalities are almost competing against each other for um, recruiting people to move we need to have housing to be able to um, you know attract and keep people in our communities and working in these you know new sectors that rely on new technology, um, that are going to be about sustainability, about climate change. We're in conversation all the time with the local college around training and skills. So municipalities are really at the center of that conversation around uh, labor and attracting labor to their communities. Right. Um, before I go to uh, James Skoniak, uh, James Maloney, I just want to say that I, I would like to come back to you at the end of, of the of the session and just see if you have any uh, closing comments about what uh, government and parliament can be doing. Um, uh, so James Koniak, what are your thoughts about uh, just transition? And, and are people able to, um, I'm kind of extrapolating on the question here, but go from oil and gas to nuclear, is it that is that simple and straightforward? Or, or to well, other I, uh, renewables? I mean, I, th I think that I, I always find the devil is in the details with with these things, and and it it's it, it, I think really in order to, to, to when you're looking at this, you really have to look at what are the jobs that are in theory displaced, and where is there a home for them. So let me give you an example. You know, when you had a coal plant, let's say, close in Nanticoke, Ontario, a lot of those building trade ro uh, jobs that 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 Sean represents, I mean, they'll go and do maintenance on. And, and work and on, on a whole series of uh, projects. So those jobs are somewhat movable. Um, uh, similarly, you know, or firms that provide environmental services or engineering support, they're fairly flexible and they can do those things. But one of the things we often forget about is, is the multiplication effect of jobs, right? So if, if you live in, uh, as I said, a, a, an area like Haldeman, Norfolk, which used to have uh, one of the largest coal plants in Canada, and that's shut down now, it's very difficult to, quote, transition that small business that was located in those small rural communities where, you know, Sean's members would go and stay at the, the motel when they were there four days a week and spend money in the restaurants or those local supply chains that supported it. So sometimes, you know, we... We talk about this in a real academic way, right? And I think we have to recognize that, yes, there is some portability. I mean, right now, most people in energy will tell you it is very tough to get people, whether they're skilled trades, whether it's engineering, whether there's other services. Um, and, and that is somewhat portable. But there's a whole series of other uh, economic impacts we have to think about. So there's also a geographic element to this. And this is where I think you get some of that division between central Canada, eastern Canada and western Canada, because people say, well, you know, a hydro dam being built in Quebec doesn't do anything for somebody out of a job in uh, in oil and gas. So I think there also has to be a real regional look at this to say, you know, if you have entire regional economies that are either growing or dropping in terms of economic activity, what do you do with those regional economies, right? And it's not just the direct people working on it, it's the indirect, it's the, the teachers who are teaching in the school, it's the, and all of those. And I, I think you probably, the Senator would, would agree, you know, that's what you would see mostly in a Cornwall. A lot of people who would leave a pulp, they go to other large facilities, they may not want to move, but they can. 
what the rest of that ecosystem does is, is what is more difficult. Yeah, and it's probably a bit harder at uh, various age levels, at, at people who are, say, over 50 or 60. And you're also talking about moving families sometimes, um, and that's not that easy. People have other kinds of obligations and jobs. That's right. But the one thing I will say is is that, it, you know, I sometimes I sometimes think we do ourselves a disservice because in the political debate, we make these things sound very binary and immediate. And that is not the case, right? Like Ontario announced it was facing a coal. It took 11 years to do it. So, you know, you also don't want to create economic anxiety for people in the first two years when something's 11 years out. And so I think we also have to be realistic again, where are you trying to get to and what's the timetable to get there? Uh, because it may not be an issue. If you have an average age of a worker at 50 years old at a plant, chances are 80% of them are retired by the time. So then it's really about the, the interim. Piece. So I also think the lack of a clear plan causes a lot of economic anxiety that is not necessary. I mean, let's be honest, oil and gas is going to continue to be a large part of the Canadian energy sector for a long time. It's not in conflict with the clean energy sources we're yeah. growing. Um, I, I have another question here, and I'll, I'll just. Great. Sorry, Andrew, go ahead. I didn't mean to go on too yeah. long. Sure. No, no, that's fine. I, I just want to get to one more question, and, and I'll ask you for a quick answer each. Um, the question is what is your number one mitigation or adaptation measure that all cities should take? And I'll ask uh, the, the municipal councillors or mayors and so forth first. So, Senator Clément, you first, and then Sean Strickland. Plan, plan, plan. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. And make sure that the community understands that they are part of this conversation. They have to elect people who have this as a priority. So, you got to vote for the people that are going to have these conversations and that are going to have frank and honest conversations about how much of the budgets need to be put towards infrastructure. Um, in Cornwall, it's all about um, our wastewater treatment plant. Uh, you know, Sean talked about that kind of infrastructure being important. Water management, crucial. So sorry, Andrew. Yeah. I got adaptation. Um, what was after, Sean what was after that? What was after adapt uh, in your question? Uh, adaptation. What was after sure. that? Um, what's, what's the number one mitigation or adaptation measure that all cities should take? That all cities should take. Well, uh, you know, I, I said it at the onset, and the and the senator just reinforced that the cities need to plan. Uh, they and they also, when they're planning, they need to to manage growth, and uh, also infrastructure. So they got to take a you know a two prong approach. They got to make sure they have the infrastructure in place to to mitigate these severe weather events, but at the same time, uh, plan for the infrastructure of the future. Uh, with advancing technologies and construction techniques and and so on to prevent um, these severe weather events from happening. So it's a, a kind of a two-track process. And I agree with all hey, the above. All um, say, James, okay. anything you wanted to add? Uh, just quickly on, on what is, cities need to do. Yeah, pick one or two things and do them. Don't pick 10 things that you want to do over 10 years. Pick one or two things and do them. Show people you can make progress and that will build momentum yeah and, and do the things that are going to have uh, potentially the biggest impact yeah thank you okay uh, that that's that concludes our session we were able to build in uh, some of the questions that came in online in the earlier part um and james did that very uh, uh, skillfully uh james maloney your your closing thoughts you will be going to a liberal caucus meeting on wednesday morning if you had a couple of minutes, what's what's the pitch you would want to be giving them, or, or what do you think they should be doing? Well, it's the same pitch I've always been giving. I mean, as uh, Sean pointed out, James pointed out, I mean, we take the transition we're going through right now, we have to stop pitting one group against another, one uh, source of energy against another, one region against another. It's, as, as James said, it's not binary and immediate. We are going through this transition. So government's role is to try to lead and get ahead of these things and create a, you know, a, a foundation or a framework where organizations and municipalities and other levels of government can work together and plan for the future so we're not caught short. So our, our role is to do that and to try to get rid of the rhetoric, stay focused on what needs to be done and, 
you know, make sure that, you know, as things evolve and they're happening more rapidly than they have been before, that we're, we're ready for them. And infrastructure is a big part of that. So we just have to keep doing what we're doing and hopefully uh, people will realize that we're not just here talking, we're actually here planning and uh, creating the right foundation. Yeah, yeah. And, and as the Senator uh, mentioned, certainly involving people in that decision making and, and community back up is, is so important. Um, I, I want to thank you all. I just want to tell our audience that uh, uh, tomorrow set, we've got uh, four sessions tomorrow, two, two panel discussions and two individual discussions. We've got a panel discussion on the caring agenda and a second uh, session on economic recovery and growth. Uh, there will be a, a, a discussion on um, reconciliation and other indigenous issues with the great uh, singer and composer uh, Tom Jackson, and a session also with Jim Carr on issues relating to uh, the prairies in Western Canada. Uh, so please join us for that tomorrow, and there's uh, more uh, on Wednesday. So with that, thank you uh, to Senator Clément, uh, James Skoniak, Sean Strickland, and uh, uh, James Maloney, back by popular demand. I think we'll, we'd love to have you back again if you'll, if you'll moderate another session. I'll, 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 I'll hear from the others first. I'll hear from the others first if they agree with my, my assessment, but uh, I think that was <laughs> Oh, <one>. yes. <laughs> Should I sign off? <laughs> we all it's great, great to meet you, James and Senator and James Skoniak. Nice to see you again. Thanks, Andrew. Oui, merci beaucoup pour la conversation.